All right, hey guys. Um, yeah, so thanks for coming along. I want to talk to you about uh, running custom types and providers, uh, particularly for web-based applications. Uh, I work, oh cracky, this thing's working, one sec. There we go. Yeah, so I'll just give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about. Um, first, we'll sort of give you some context, talk about the circumstances that led us into investigating writing custom types and providers, and eventually deciding to use them. Uh, then we'll move on to a worked example where we'll write a custom type, or a bunch of custom types and providers from scratch. Uh, we'll do a demo, live demo in the console, you know, pray to the demo gods that it works well. And uh, then at the end, we'll look at the next steps. Uh, so what we would do after um, the worked example to sort of make it production ready, because you know, we can't do everything in a presentation worked example. So let's look at the circumstances or our, our situation. Oopsie, there we go. Um, yeah, so the build engineering team at Atlassian, we run a lot of infrastructure um, and we manage a lot of that infrastructure using Puppet. Um, the ones, the, the res sorry, the services that I want to focus on are Sonotype Nexus and Bamboo. So those aren't familiar with Nexus. It's a repository hosting uh, tool that allows you to host repositories like you know, Docker registries, um, NPM, and what we use primarily, Maven repositories. Uh, Maven repositories are for Java, basically. Uh, the things that we manage in the uh, Nexus instances, the m most important things are the repository definitions, um, security policy, and uh, we do a bunch of proxying for performance as well, so we need to manage that. Uh, the Bamboo uh, uh, services, if you're not familiar with Bamboo, it's a, a build tool, it's like a CI, CD tool. Uh, we use it internally for running builds. Um, I think we have 20 instances internally. And uh, we need to manage things like global variables, defaults, and secu again, security policy. So we use configuration files, well, originally we used configuration files to manage the config for these things. So um, we noticed over time that using the configuration files actually had drawbacks for us. Uh, the first one, uptime. This one affected Nexus more than it did Bamboo. Uh, with, with Nexus, uh, our configuration changes would require us to restart Nexus. So when we did a deployment, we would have to, especially if it was a deployment that affected all of the Nexus instances, we would actually have to shut them off and we'd have a couple of minutes of, of downtime because Nexus takes at least a few minutes to start. This means hundreds of red builds uh, if, if you're running it uh, when the developers are actually you know, running CI. Uh, it's not very good and it makes our customers sad and we get lots of, you know, often would get um, comments in the support channel if we rolled out a change and caused red builds. So that's one problem. Configuration drift, another problem. This affected both Nexus and Bamboo. So uh, we would have the issue of maybe one of us would go in and make a change for a workaround, make a change to test something, and because the configura underlying configuration file hadn't changed, uh, Puppet wouldn't notice it and it would not be rolled back. Uh, the only time it would be rolled back if we completely destroy that instance and reprovision it from scratch, which we don't do that often with the, the, these long running instances. Um, the same thing with Bamboo as well. You know, uh, we'd have a, a small change and uh, because the, it wasn't reflected in the configuration file, Puppet wouldn't notice it, wouldn't change it back. We wouldn't get alerts for it. The last uh, drawback is uh, limitation. So Bamboo in particular had this problem of uh, only exposing a very small amount of the configuration through configuration files. Uh, most of the configuration for Bamboo is done through the web interface. Uh, so this means that when we first provision a Bamboo instance, somebody on our team would have to go in and click and type and submit. Uh, it's not great. It also leads to more configuration drift because someone has to follow a run book setting up the instance and then um, over time, you know, that's not managed by configuration tools, that drifts. So there were, there were our drawbacks, that's sort of what, that's what drove us to consider using um, a custom type and provider. As we said here, how do we address them? Using custom types. So before we have a look at um, what custom types and providers are, we'll do a quick res refresher on the concepts of puppet types and providers. So we have the idea of uh, resources. So resources are 
instances of a type. So you'll have many file instances or file resources in your manifest. Um, they're associated with a type, they have a name, and they have attributes. Uh, then we have a, a type. So a, a type allows us to represent resources. It, tell, it tells Puppet how to accept resources in the DSL in your manifest files. Um, native types have a Ruby implementation associated with them. Also, actually, all types have a, a Ruby implementation associated with them. Um, attributes, and uh, they'll also have one or more providers associated with them. Um, and then we move on to the next thing, providers. What are providers? Um, they're associated with a type. They actually interact with the underlying system. They, they, they do the work. So whether it's running a command or, in our case, uh, firing off an HTTP request, um, that's, that's what they do. So here's a concrete example of uh, comparing uh, one of the default types to a custom type. So we'll start with uh, the default type of user. So what do we have here? This is the, the type. So we've got a resource. This is a resource with a type user, and then name Tim, and some attributes. So as we know, the type is user. And if you're running this on a Linux system, more than likely you'll be using the user ad provider, which is one of the default ones that comes with Puppet. Under the hood, it runs user ad with some arguments. Uh, the arguments will be sort of derived from your, um, from your attributes. What we also have is, on this side, a custom type and provider. So the type, we've made one called Bamboo Agent. Now this is a resource, Bamboo Agent. Name local, we've said we do not want it to be enabled. So yep, we've defined a custom type somewhere and the, it has a provider that instead of running a, an exec command or a syscall or whatever, this one's going to fire up a HTTP request. Now in here I've written curl, but you might use uh, a Ruby HTTP library. You probably should. Uh, so yeah, uh, the conclusion is that we can use a custom type and provider, or custom types and providers, to manage our web-based services like Nexus and Bamboo and many other tools out there. So these were the sort of positives, the sort of wins or the pros for uh, using custom types from our perspective. For us, it meant fewer restarts, so less downtime for uh, Nexus in particular. Um, no more drift, that addresses both Nexus and Bamboo. So the great thing about no more, no more drift, or sorry, the great thing about using these types is that they can be aware of every single um, feature that we want them to be aware of. And uh, fine-grained configuration, so that allows us to configure so much more of, the, of uh, the Bamboo service, so much more than we could using configuration files and templates. There are some downsides. With many decisions, there are usually uh, you know, something to weigh up, so pros and cons. The cons, uh, engineering cost. So somebody has to spend time sort of researching, designing, and then implementing the type and provider. Uh, if you have a really well-defined API for, you, for the service or application that you're writing against, you might be able to automatically generate a lot of the provider and type, and I've seen that in some uh, types on the Forge. Uh, but somebody will still have to, if, especially if you're doing a migration, someone's gonna have to do the migration work to change from these configuration files to the new types and providers. Uh, more dependencies, so if you've got some Ruby gems, um, let's say doing those HTTP requests, so, uh, you've got to install them, and then you've got to make sure they're installed, uh, maintained. That's not a, such a big cost, but it's still something to think about. And then there's uh, authentication. So when you're using files, uh, you generally running Puppet as root or a privileged user, so you don't need to worry about authentication because that user is able to overwrite or make changes to the configuration file. But um, when you're using an HTTP interface, you're going to need permission to make those changes, so you'll need to do it as an admin user or something. So that's something else to consider. Uh, it's, again, something that can be solved, not that big of a problem, but something to think about. So basically we decided it's not okay to have somebody clicking and submitting changes on 20 Bamboo instances and, and growing. Um, it's just not fair to them, but it's also error prone and you know, a bit barbaric. So we created Bamboo REST module. Uh, it's on the Forge. Uh, we automated away the pain for Mike, um, the guy on our team who usually did it. And uh, yeah, now you know, we have uh, quite a few, like this is just a small, this is just a small summary of the um, types um, that we have. Um, but yeah, it's 
seriously helped us a lot. We actually have alerts for the changes um, that have been made um, that would have originally just drifted into oblivion, but um, now they're, ch they're fixed up you know, every single time there's a puppet run and we get a notification so we know that somebody's gone into the config and clicked something. We also had a problem with uh, the Nexus uh, instances. We decided it's not okay to allow this configuration drift to continue and we created the Nexus REST module, which again has a whole bunch of uh, types and providers. Very, it doesn't cover the entire configuration, but it covers all, all the areas that, uh, that we needed and it's um, fairly easy to extend. The important thing, uh, the most important thing for us was seamless changes. So we didn't need to worry about scheduling rollouts to Nexus uh, to low build times. You know, we can, we can roll out changes now anytime, not worry about restarts. Just a quick point, um, the module, those modules I just spoke about and the module that uh, we're doing the work demo, uh, sorry, worked example, they uh, don't cover the installation of, of the tools or, or the services rather. Um, they just do configuration. So you could conceivably do the installation and the configuration in one module. It's just that we, we haven't done it that way. Okay, so let's get into our worked example. Uh, actually, let's quickly go over it. So we'll do the setup, which is just a quick discussion of sort of what's required uh, if you're doing this yourself. Uh, we'll go ahead and implement a type as far as we can until we need to do a provider. Then we'll go ahead and write a provider. <clears throat> we'll extend the type and the provider sort of simultaneously, adding a few properties. And then we'll look at sort of, um, we'll get a type that we've written uh, beforehand and we'll work, uh, work on interaction between types. So helpful tools. Um, yeah, Puppet's gonna be pretty useful in this situation. Same with Ruby. Uh, Docker, in our case, we need Docker because the application that we're gonna write our type and provider against is running on, uh, in, in a Docker container. These ones here, Bundler, IRB, and curl, they're useful for exploring um, and sort of the, the development loop, but they're not necessary. So uh, I've been talking about Nexus all the time. I've actually been talking about Nexus 2. There's a new version of Nexus, which our uh, provider, sorry, our module on the Forge does not support. Um, this is, so I decided it'd be a good opportunity to get started on one for this presentation. Uh, so we're using Nexus 3 as an example. There are other reasons why I use Nexus 3. Uh, it's easy to run <clears throat> in Docker, so I, I don't need to like worry about setting it up and having problems during demos. Uh, the other thing that's kind of useful about, uh, about it is that it's a good fit for the Puppet resource mod, uh, model. So it allows me to demonstrate quite a few different things uh, pretty easily. Okay, so the types that we're gonna implement. Um, we're gonna do a Nexus 3 repository, which is essentially, it's gonna be a Maven repository with some attributes, a limited set of the attributes. So there's way more attributes that we could do, uh, but I'm just gonna stick, stick with name, which is just a string rep, uh, representing the name of the repo online. So you can basically disable it or enable it. And a blob store field, which brings us to the next type that we're gonna write, a Nexus 3 blob store. It's an abstraction for the storage. Uh, at the moment, I think it still only supports file system storage, but I guess there are plans in the future to make it work with S3 or whatever. Um, so this blob store actually points to one of these blob store resources. Um, and so yeah, the attributes for blob store is name and path, both strings. Okay, so what we need to do before we actually start writing code for our uh, type and provider, we need to do a little bit of reconnaissance. We need to discover the endpoints for our service. So at a minimum, we're gonna need to be able to query all resources, be able to create a new resource, delete a new resource, and then, oh sorry, delete an existing resource, my bad, and update an existing resource. So we can do an update by deleting and then recreating, um, but if an update uh, endpoint exists, that's preferable. For my particular example, the API wasn't, there, there wasn't any developer documentation for the API, so I did a little bit of searching. Um, so this is Firebug. It's better if you can develop against one that's documented because it's sort of a little bit of a contract between you and the, you and the uh, <coughs> software vendor, but in, in our case, we didn't have that. Sorry. So this is the sort of the shape of a, of a puppet type and provider um, setup. So this is your module with custom types and providers. 
You have your lib directory, which has all your code in it. Um, if you also had like your setup stuff in here, you might have a manifest directory as well, but we, in this case, we're just going pure, pure Ruby, so we just have lib. Under lib, we have Puppet. So this is everything under Puppet is stuff that interacts with the Puppet API. In particular, the type and provider API. There's also Puppet X. This is where we can put helper code. So custom, custom code that doesn't actually dire uh, directly inter interact with the Puppet API. Um, in our case, what we have is stuff that interacts with uh, the application. So it interacts with Nexus. We also have something here that um, understands X direct RPC, which is some RPC protocol. And we have just a like util class, which has some helper functions in it. Back inside the Puppet um, directory, we have a provider directory. We have the name of our... Um, Sorry. Yeah, we have the name of our types, so Nexus 3 Blob Store, Nexus 3 Repository, and then we have two files called RPC. We'll go into that a little bit later, why they're called RPC. Uh, and then we have the type directory, which has our types in it. So it's, it's actually, the naming is quite important. Puppet's a bit pedantic about naming. The names of the types need to be the names of these directories here, and inside the files, inside the source, you know, the names need to match those as well. So everything sort of has to line up for it to work. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's get started with a worked example, uh, writing a, a new type. So to get started, we make our RB file under lib puppet type. This is the name of our type. And then we call puppet type dot new type. Then we use an intern string with the name of the type. Okay, let's uh, let's run this command. Uh, sorry, let's let's try and. Uh, run Puppet. So I'm going to see if I can do it. I've had a bit of problems with demoing lately, but we'll see how we go. Uh, so first things first, we actually need to run. Let me just kill it and run it again. We need to run um, Nexus. So I've just restored the data for Nexus, so it's like back in its default state. And then we'll do a, a run on it. It should take like 15, 20 seconds if I'm lucky. Demo gods, please favor me. I think I'm seeing favor from the demo gods. All right, good. In like less than 10 seconds, it should be good. All right, cool, we're good. And let's just check the UI. Okay, it's up. So we'll go back here and let's run some public code. So yeah, actually this is kind of important. Um, on the sort of worked example slides, I've got this tag up here, this is a git tag. So I have a repo for this. There's a link to it on a slide later on. Um, you can actually go to each of these tags and sort of follow the progress. Um, if you're interested, and you can actually like you know, see the commit messages, and I think there are some mistakes in there as well. So if you're interested in seeing what kind of mistakes I've made, that's how you do it. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna run that command. I've got it in my command history. I'm not gonna type it all and make you watch me. Um, so what we're gonna do here, we're gonna check out that tag. This one's important. We need to export RubyLib. So we need to change the RubyLib to make it look at this directory, um, or actually our lib directory. So if you've installed this module, then Puppet will do that for you and put it in the, in the Ruby path. However, I haven't, this is not in the, the Puppet modules directory. This is in my dev source directory. So I need to tell Ruby to look there. Uh, what else are we doing? Okay, we're doing a Puppet resource on our new type that we've just write, written, which is weird because we don't have any implementation really yet. And we're going to also try a puppet apply. Let's just to see what happens, right? So not surprising, both failed. So our puppet resource command didn't work because we haven't overridden instances. Uh, let's go back to the slides. We haven't overridden instances. That makes sense. We haven't written any code yet. Of course, puppet's not going to know how to get a list of all the um, the Nexus three repositories. The other failure we had was. Um, when we tried to do an apply, it basically said, oh, no, I don't know about what to do with this title. I don't know what to do. So it failed again. Not really surprising, but you know, it's sometimes in the dev loop, it, it pays to start early. You feel like you're getting some feedback. And so the next thing we're gonna do is add a name var. So that tells Puppet which attribute is its name, what to do with the name. And so what we do is we store the name in an attribute or a parameter called name. And so, Let's see what happens now. Uh, was it step two? O2. So what are we doing? We are 
just doing a checkout. Then we're going to try a re uh, resource again, and we're going to try apply again. So it's actually the same set of commands as last time. Not surprisingly, uh, re resource list didn't work. However, the apply actually worked. What? How could the apply have worked? Well, this, this type of resource, as far as Puppet's aware, so this is it here. As far as Puppet's aware, it doesn't care about the state. Puppet doesn't need to maintain a state for it because it wasn't insurable. So what we need to do, we need to add this uh, insurable directive. By making it insurable, Puppet knows now that it needs to query the state and update the state. So an example of a, uh, a resource, sorry, a type that uh, doesn't need state is an exec, right? <clears throat> exec just happens uh, every time, although you can, def you can stop it from happening, but it, it doesn't have state, per se. Uh, we also add some documentation in line. Very easy to do. OK, so let's uh, try again with step 03. Clear. So this time we're just going to try the, try the apply, because we know the resource thing doesn't work. And before our apply worked, now it's not working. So we have a new error, which you know, it's kind of good. It's sort of helping us figure out where we need to go. The, the problem is we need to, like Puppet doesn't know how, how any way to determine whether a resource exists yet or not. So we're going to need to tell Puppet how to, how to do that. And we will. Oops, I need to keep that going. We will tell Puppet. So we've sort of got as far as we can uh, writing a type with, without uh, a provider. So we're going to need to start working on the provider. But before we even start working on the provider, we actually have, well, let's have a quick discussion about the uh, PuppetX uh, files. So we could p conceivably uh, write like all the logic for communicating with the application inside the provider. However, it would be extremely repetitive and uh, just sort of feels wrong, right? We could, instead of doing that, what we've done is made some uh, classes inside PuppetX that allow us to communicate with the application. So the important, most important thing is we have a, a class method or a static method called remote, which we'll use from all of the provider code. And it's just the one thing that we'll use from the provider code to communicate with the application. And essentially, we can just pass in <clears throat> arguments that will be sent to the application. And then when, what, oops, whatever the application says back to us will be returned to whatever calls it. So that's that. OK, um, the other th important thing that kind of applies to all types and providers, especially ones, sorry, not all of them, all the ones that need to deal with HTTP services, you'll need to get config from somewhere. So you need to know the base URL, or actually, like, yeah, yeah, you'll need to know the base URL, you'll need to know the credentials for your service. <clears throat> you have to get them from somewhere, probably a config file. So that's what we do here. We lazily load this stuff. So um, the first time that that static class, that first time that's called, there's going to be no config. So this will be called, and it will fetch it from a file. After that, subsequent calls to remote will just use the, the cached um, version of the configuration. So now we write a basic provider. This isn't two lines, unfortunately. There's a, f a bit more involved. So again, we call the Puppet API. We open up with Puppet type, type, and then the intern string of the type name needs to be the same as the other one, dot provide. And then we choose a provider name. So the provider name kind of needs, well, by convention, it should be, it should describe how Puppet will, like which tool or which means uh, Puppet will use to make the changes. So in our case, uh, Nexus is using uh, an RPC uh, protocol. We're not using, it's actually not a REST interface, it's, it's some, um, I forgot what it's called, X, X Direct RPC. So it's not JSON RPC, it's X Direct, X Direct RPC. So we've called this provider RPC. Uh, actually, just a quick one. Uh, the example with the user um, resource, the default one, it has a provider called user add because it uses the user add command line tool. Okay, we have to implement something because we care about uh, state. Uh, we need to implement uh, instances and exists. So instances allow instances allows us to query which instances or yeah, which instances of this uh, type exist on the system. So what we're doing here, we hit that remote function that I was talking about before, and get a response and put it inside repositories. We're actually going to filter out anything that's not a Maven 2 repository because I just wanted to pare back the scope for this worked, worked uh, example. So if you actually completed this, you wouldn't have this filter here. This is just the filter. 
And then for each item inside that um, payload that's returned to us, we call this new method here, right? And so for each new method, it tells Puppet, you know, this instance exists, this instance exists, so on. Um, in our case, at the moment, <clears throat> we're only saying ensure present. In other words, saying to Puppet, this thing exists. And then another thing we're setting is the name, because at the moment, we only have one attribute, name. We have another method called exists, which is exists with a question mark at the end of it. Uh, it just is a Boolean, needs to return a Boolean of whether something exists or not. Now, just a quick note, this one here has a self dot. This function has a self dot, which means it's a class method or a static method. Um, it's, it's not associated with an instance. This one here has no self, right? So it's a, this will be called on an instance, which means you'll actually have access to instance variables. There's a special instance variable called property hash, which is like a cached version of all the resources, these specific resources, properties. Um, so what we can actually say is, this thing exists if uh, ensure for this resource is present. And so that's what we're doing. Now we can run puppet resource, and we should actually get stuff. So the demo gods are being so good to me today. Step, is that four? Five. Oh, yeah, so step four doesn't have a command line thing, so you can't really run anything for it. Step five. So what are we going to do? Just going to do puppet resource on Nexus 3 repository. That's pretty good, right? That's progress. So we're actually talking to the application now and getting a response. So just to sort of prove what's going on here, uh, I've got to log in. Give me a second. Admin, admin, one, two, three. Oops, did I read that out loud? Uh, it's default, sorry. Uh, no secret access. So repositories. And yeah, so that's what we actually have. So that's kind of cool. Um, we'll keep going back to that UI now that we're actually interacting with the, <clears throat> the underlying tool. Just to prove that I'm not like faking this demo. Or add further proof. It's not complete proof. All right. Oopsie. I need to go back in here, don't I? Play. Yeah, and so there's a screenshot in case the you know, demo didn't quite pan out. So far it has, though. OK, so the next thing we want to do, we want to be able to create and destroy resources. You may not have noticed, or you may or may not have noticed, that so far we haven't implemented that logic. So if we tried to do a puppet apply, uh, we'd be out of luck unless our stuff exactly matched what's, which is already in there. Create, well, the method for create, again, it's an instance method, so no self. Um, and we just get to do whatever we want to create our resource. So yeah, in our case, it's a, um, an HTTP request using RPC. But this could just as easily be a, you know, a shell to a command or something else, whatever you want to do. The destroy uh, method is uh, just, as, just the same. You get to do whatever you want in there. Um, you can, if you want, do error handling in there. I haven't. There's no error handling in here. So if, if there are problems, Puppet won't barf. Um, there, there is some error handling later on just as an example. So we'll look at that. Uh, but at the moment, this doesn't do any error handling. OK, let's uh, check out tags, uh, step six, rather. Step six. So what are we doing? I'm doing a puppet apply. And ah, yeah, yeah, this thing here. So I don't know. Um, you may or may not be familiar with purge uh, or the, the uh, resources type. Um, but puppet has this resources type that you can actually, it allows you to sort of apply things across all instances of a type or all resources of a type. What we're doing here is we're saying, uh, Puppet, I want you to resource, uh, sorry, I want you to purge all uh, Nexus 3 repositories that aren't in the manifest. So basically, it says only maintain Nexus 3 repositories that are found in you know, the PP files. It's useful for this demo, but it's also quite useful. Like we use it in production for our um, Bamboo and Nexus stuff as well. Then we have two Nexus 3 repositories. Now, remember, these ones don't, these are new ones. They don't match what's already in there. So Maven snapshots and Maven releases is what's currently in the UI. We want to define a couple of new ones that are from the demo rather than from the default data set. So let's run this. What happens? Please work. Please work. Whew. No red. Good. All right, so it worked. What has it done? It's purged the unmanaged resources. Good. We don't want unmanaged resources. We want to avoid drift. Is that a hand up? No, someone adjusting a hand. Never mind. Um, and what do we do? We create a couple of resources too. So repo one and number two. 
Let's do a refresh on this thing. <laughs> yes, it's real. It's not fake. I'm not, I'm not faking this, guys. All right. Um, so yeah, let's go back to the slides. So just going into the, I mean, don't need to go over these. The demo worked. So cool. OK. All right, there was one thing. Um, we didn't see this in the demo yet, but if I run that command again, oh no, the demo, ah, OK, the demos will have to, no more demos until the end now. Keynote has locked me out of my keyboard. Sorry. OK, so you notice here that uh, if we run the same command twice, Puppet will keep creating the resources. And I mentioned before, there's no um, error checking. so. Um, it's not good, right? We don't want Puppet to create resources every single run that already exist. Oh, goodness gracious me. I have to click. I have to click. OK. Um, so yeah, this is, <clears throat> excuse me. This is because we are using exists, and uh, we're, we're making exists look at the property hash. It's looking at the cached uh, version of the resource. If we had implemented a, an HTTP request, it, it um, made, made Puppet do an HTTP request for every exists call then it would have found it. So what we can do instead of, because we don't really want to do hundreds of HTTP requests for stuff that basically never changes, what you can do instead is implement this prefetch method, um, which you can just make it leech off of instances. But what it does is it takes your resources that are in your um, manifest, and it takes the instances that it found on the um, underlying system, and it sort of links them up, and then it sets the caches for them. And so that's what we're doing here. We pull the instances, we, we reuse that instances method, then we iterate through each of the resources that, for this particular uh, type, and we link them up with the repositories that we found. Uh, next. OK, and so uh, now we've got it. So, uh, sorry, for am saying so, so often. The demo thing has thrown me off. Um, now we can run it multiple times, and it won't try and recreate existing services, uh, existing resources rather. Okay, we want to add some more properties. Let's add one called online. This is the one that determines whether the repository is enabled or not. So we have something here that we didn't use for name var, uh, new new values that allows us to restrict the the values for this uh, attribute. So in our case. True or false. We, we can just say this attribute only accepts true or false. There's something else interesting there. Um, default to. So you, if it's not defined in the manifest, then it will default to that value. And then the last thing, which is a, I don't know if it's a real world or, word or not, but munge. Uh, it's one of the, it's from the Puppet API. It's not, it's not something that I created, although I still like it. Um, munge is something that Puppet will run the, the text through from the, from the manifest before associating it or before trying to apply it. So you basically can use it for normalization. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So that one there. OK, and so we've added it in the type. We need to do some associated changes in the provider as well. So we need to make sure that when we do that self.instances, when we fetch all of the instances from the application, we need to make sure we pull in that value as well and uh, put it in the property hash. So that's all we're doing there. The other thing is when we're pushing, when we're creating, we need to make sure that this new attribute is in the payload that's being sent to the application. And that's all we're doing here. That was just name before. Now it's name and online. We also have to do getters and setters. Um, so with the getter, we can use that property hash, which is the cached um, sort of list of, or hash rather, of all the attributes. And then we have a setter there as well. Um, this case, we're not actually doing anything except setting a flag to say, oh, something has changed. Puppet has a, a method that we're going to look at in a sec, uh, like right now, <laughs> flush. Uh, yeah, so what flush will be called once per uh, resource. And, and that's, that's right, it's re per, per instance, right? So we don't have the self dot. It'll be called once for each of those after all the operations have been performed on it to allow you to flush it. So in our case, if changes have been made, so if any setters have been uh, called on, any resource, on this particular resource, um, we know that we get a chance to send an update call to Nexus. And then we also need to make sure we update the property hash. And so we run resource, and we get our online uh, being reported as well, online attribute. Let's try and apply. 
And uh, oops, I didn't actually. Oh yeah, cool. Uh, no, I didn't. Can I go back? Yes, I can. I didn't actually highlight that. My mistake. Um, we set online to false on uh, number two, and so we can see here only one changed, and it was the one that we changed from true to false. And also, if we look in the UI, which I would love to demo, but I can't. Um, the yeah, we can see one of them's offline now, number two. Okay, uh, another one. This is last one. I just want to demonstrate one more thing with uh, types. Um, we can actually set in a validate. There's, there's a, so there's munge, uh, default to, uh, what is it, values? New values. And there's another one, validate. So validate lets you do sort of arbitrary validation. You can actually go like really far, far into depth. You can make it even go and check that, um, you know, you can even hit the uh, application and check something that it exists, that it's, that it's reasonable if you want in here. In our case, we're just doing something really basic, like matching it against a regular expression. Um, but you can do fancy things in here if you want to. And uh, yeah, here's, here's an example of a, a fail call. So we, we call fail here, and this is basically we'll say that uh, no, it didn't work, not good. Uh, here's another example of a fail, actually. Um, so in the setter for blob store, we call the fail method, and we also don't set the, the prop, uh, flush thing because we don't want it to be flushed. This particular field, blob store, it's immutable. So that's why we're, for the setter, we're saying <clears throat> if someone tries to run a setter on this, we need to make sure we fail. Okay, so when we try and do a resource, we get a list of our uh, a list of resources that now also contain one extra attribute, blob store. And when we try and do an apply, we try and change the blob stores for one of them, and we get a failure. Blob store property is immutable, and we get some red text, which makes us feel bad. Cool. All right, so that's our first type and provider. Like most of the hard work has been done. We're over the hump, so to say. So now we need to, okay, we're gonna write a whole new type and provider. Not really, I'm just joking. We've got one that we've already prepared for the blob store. There's, um, I think, one or two things we're gonna look at. No, that, that's it. We just wanna show you a demo. So um, we're gonna do a puppet apply here. Um, let's go back. We're doing a puppet apply here, and we wanna purge the repository and the blob stores. So we want to make sure that only the repositories and blob stores that we care about are under management. What we're going to do, create two repos, one called S3 repo with a blob store called S3, and another one, NFS repo, with a blob store at NFS. We also need to make sure we make those blob stores because um, Nexus requires the blob store to actually exist. Now, if we've got purge blob store, uh, we need to make sure that you know, we're creating blob stores for these repos to use. So. Yeah, as we can see here, we've sort of got those. This is the, um, sorry, that's the blob store NFS, and that's, sorry, that's, yeah, and that's the blob store it's going to use. So this repository uses the NFS blob store. We also make sure we create the NFS blob store. Let's do our run. It worked, but um, the repository was created before the blob store, which actually shouldn't work and actually doesn't work if you look at uh, Nexus, the Nexus logs. Not good. So what we can do is we can create relationships between types. We can create soft requires between types. There's this thing called auto require, which means for every instance of this resource, which, which resource are we looking at? We're looking at the uh, Nexus 3 repository type. Every single Nexus 3 repository is going to require a file, uh, a specific file, this one here. So this is the configuration file. Um, we can't talk to Nexus unless that configuration file exists, so we might as well order require that. We have another example of an order require here, which is we want to make sure that every single Nexus, um, Nexus repository type requires a blob store type, but it doesn't require, there's no single one that they all require. They all need to require the one that they are linked to or associated with. And so that's what we're doing here, and that's what that self is. So we actually say, uh, I require my blob store if I have a blob store. If it doesn't have a blob store, I won't make any requirement at all. The interesting thing is it's a soft require, so if you do a uh, require in your manifest and that requirement isn't satisfied, if that thing doesn't exist, you'll get red text and feel sad. This is a soft require, so it won't enforce it. And actually, it won't, uh, as far as I'm aware, it won't report it, even with debug flags. So most of the time that's good, but sometimes you kind of wish it did do that. And now we can see we do our uh, apply again, and the blob store is created, then the repository. Blob store, then the repository. 
And, in, and now let's do, like, take it one step further. I'll remove the config file. And uh, we can see that Puppet makes that file first before making any of the repositories or blob stores. Something else that's interesting, <coughs> um, our prefetch won't work if our config file doesn't exist. So this is for a sort of bootstrap operation. When you're first bootstrapping, you're going to see this red text. And it's going to be hard to fight the feeling of being sad because there's red text. But you sort of can't do anything about it because you're bootstrapping. And you can't really have the configuration file there if you want Puppet to create it. It's OK, though, because it's only the prefetch that fails. Um, the, uh, was it? Not, not the prefetch, sorry, the instances uh, call fails. But the prefetch will work, and your instances will actually still be created. Um, it only ever happens on the bootstrap, the first run. So all subsequent runs won't have that problem. Uh, if anyone does come up with like a cool way around it, let me know. But uh, we've sort of just accepted it. OK, we're done with the worked example. We've got this. Um, Here's the repository. Uh, I've just given these slides to Gretchen, so she'll probably put them on the site sometime really soon. Um, but the slides are actually in that repo. All the code is in that repo. Um, all the sort of commands you can run are in there too. Uh, demo. So I got kind of half demoed. Uh, I'll do a little bit more. I've got actually, I'll, maybe I'll open up to questions. And then if there are no questions, I'll do a quick demo. Um, so. Let me, let me finish this, since we may not have time for demo. Uh, areas for improvement, um, robustness. So like I mentioned before, there's a little bit of missing uh, stuff. So handling errors. Logging, not so good. Uh, tests, definitely need uh, unit tests. Uh, something like Ruby, you're bound to shoot yourself in the foot. There's like really, really loosey-goosey type system. Um, you can easily, easily find yourself in trouble. So get some aspect tests. That's what we have for the, the types on the forge. Might want some acceptance tests. Probably a good idea, especially because you're interfacing with another system. Um, and some CI to automatically run those acceptance and unit tests. Maybe using Bamboo, maybe. Uh, and publish to the Forge, because you know, sharing is cool. And most of the time, you don't want to write it. Like That's one of the awesome things about Puppet is, oh, I want to do Nginx. I don't want to write a module for it. I'll just pull one down. And normally, there's one there for everything. Other resources. Uh, this one here is super awesome. Um, this book, it's really, really short. It's like exactly what you need for doing types and providers. Highly recommend it. Uh, Shit Gary says, uh, this is Gary Larissa, um, puppet engineer. Uh, writes really cool stuff, very useful stuff uh, relating to types and providers, among other things. But he's got like, I think, three or four blog posts that's specifically very helpful in this area. And of course, the source. You can always look at the source. Um, this is, very good resource. OK, so go away and write some damn types and provide us. And upload them to the, the SourceForge. Uh, not the SourceForge, sorry, the PuppetForge. Nobody uploads anything to SourceForge. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, question. Thank you very much for the, the talk, by the way. But, um, so is there anything you do differently um, if if the, the interaction with Nexus in this case, if it was done via a gem that you had written rather than you know, embedding it via puppet underscore x. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, if it was a gem, um, it, it would basically, we would just have less stuff in our puppet x directory, and we would just use the gem. So at the top of our source files, let me just go back. We would just have like one extra require, which would be the gem name. It would actually be sensible to put that in a gem, depending on how big it is. Uh, any other questions? Maybe time for one more. <laughs> yeah, um, I saw in your source code, you do the authentication via a configuration file um, located in ETC Puppet. Is there a better way, uh, a Puppet-like way? Uh, I, I don't know what you mean by the puppet-like way, but there is probably a better way, yes. Yeah. So uh, we'll I hear. Say that again. Yeah. Do you have an what? example? No, I, I'm not aware of one. Uh, <laughs> that's actually what we use. Uh, we, we have a, a configuration file somewhere on, on that system. Um, oh, no, it's on the Puppet Master, I think. Um, yeah, I might have to get back to you about that. I, th I think it is on this. I think we have the, the configuration file on the system with the text, uh, with the credentials of, in place. Um, the function. Thing from a provider or type uh, 
to read this file, it, it must on the agent. Yeah, it is on the agent. That's yeah, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. So let's thank Tim for this great talk. Thank you.